Welcome back to another episode of Derech Eretz with me, your host, Romy Stach. The biblical prophet Isaiah states, Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. The pursuit of a just society is one of the most fundamental concepts of Judaism. Rabbi Yossi Goldman elaborates further. One of the great voices for civil rights and social justice was, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King, who spoke out vibrantly, vividly. I had a dream. And he paid for it with his life. But he wasn't the only one. The name stuck in my mind for over 50 years of a young Jewish kid, a student named Andrew Goodman, who went down to Mississippi to campaign for civil rights. And he and his two friends were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. To me, it's no surprise that so many icons of the struggles for humanity, the struggles for social justice over the ages have been members of the Jewish community. Not necessarily religious, but I believe that there is something in their Jewish upbringing and in our history that is responsible for that sensitivity and that consciousness. If we look here in South Africa, icons of the struggle, an inordinate percentage of them were members of the Jewish faith. I don't have to give names, we all know. Far beyond our percentages in this community. Were they religious? No. But they were brought up with Jewish values. Values that go back all the way to the beginning, to the Bible, to the exodus from Egypt, where we were taught to remember what it felt like when we were slaves in Egypt and to be sensitive to the feelings and needs and considerations of others and not to discriminate against anyone. These values motivated and propelled generations of young Jews to get involved in social justice causes. Once upon a time, it was communism, socialism, hippieism back in the 60s. People like Bob Dylan, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Abby Hoffman, Mark Rudd, not religious people. Mark Rudd was the grandchild of immigrants who came to America. But there was a driving force for justice. Justice, justice shalt thou pursue, says the Bible. And that consciousness of caring for others, of not allowing injustice and discrimination to take place is something which drove these people. So whether they would admit it or not, I believe the Jewish value system in their DNA, in their blood, in their childhood upbringing, parents and grandparents all the way back had a profound influence on their choice to put themselves at risk. In South Africa, those people were white, they were free, they could have lived comfortable lives, they chose danger, they chose exile, they chose prison and worse for a cause because they believed in it, because they were passionate about it. There is something in Jewish blood that we want to change the world for good, to make it better. And all of these social activists share that. But if we go back all the way to our beginning, look at the Ten Commandments. Fully half of the Ten Commandments are interhuman relationships. Not to murder, not to steal, adultery, no lying, no jealousy. Those are the greatest commandments, the most important things given to us by God at Mount Sinai, the great revelation. Moses brought down the word from God. We heard it directly from him at Mount Sinai. It wasn't only faith. It wasn't only the Sabbath. It wasn't only no idolatry or paganism or to honor our parents. It was to be good and kind and concerned with one another. Hundreds of the commandments of the Bible are interpersonal, interhuman responsibility, not religious ritual. So what's the mystery 
Why is it that so many Jewish people have been at the forefront of all these struggles for social change and social justice over the centuries? It's no mystery. It goes back to the very, very beginning of the Bible, of our peoplehood, of our experiences in Egypt as slaves and becoming free. And it's in our blood, it's in our DNA that we have to be sensitive to others because of our own experiences and to do what's right and to be partners with God in making the world a more godly and better place. The WITS Justice Project is a project of the Journalism Department of the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. Through investigative journalism, this remarkable team aims to get to the root of miscarriages of justice and raises awareness of issues within the criminal justice system. The WITS Justice Project um, tries or aims to use the power of the media to bring about justice when the criminal justice system has failed to do so. Um, and we're also fairly intent on consciousness raising about um, prison conditions and miscarriages of justice and um, giving a voice to the voiceless. Being an investigative journalist in South Africa in general is incredibly important. Um, I mean, I don't think that um, a lot of media houses have the time and the money to put into investigative journalism, but it is a really good tool to um, help journalists hold people accountable and expose the truth. Prisoners' rights are also human rights. And when I first joined the Justice Project, I think most South Africans, and myself included, um, still believed that we we believed in the myth of the Rainbow Nation and um, South Africa was still the darling of the human rights community and we didn't believe that to the torture that was meted out to political um, politicos in the past was now being meted out to criminals and it came as an enormous surprise when we discovered that prison conditions were not that dissimilar to the conditions in um, apartheid South Africa. 2004, I was arrested with other co-accused that were unknown to me. And then we were charged with murder, robbery, position of unlicensed firearm and position of uh, unlicensed ammunition. So the proceedings went on to the court and then Everything was built on the foundation of forgery and then everything was manipulated and then the presiding officer was misled until she found us all guilty and then she convicted us on the 22nd of July 2004. And then while I was behind bars, I was writing to different government departments requesting for them to intervene on my behalf because of I was behind bars for the crime I did not commit. It was like, uh, this is the end of my life, because I was facing life sentence, not knowing how long will I stay in prison. And then I just say, it's a God will. Let the will be done. But at the end of the day, uh, the truth will come out. The little that I can imagine, I would imagine it's really painful, it's really difficult. It's not just for the person that has been arrested and has had this happen to them, but they're for their families, you know. As a child and your father is sitting in prison for murder, how, what do you say to your friends? Um, it opens you up for bullying and for being um, outcast over certain things that you have no say in. Uh, so yeah, families do get broken up over this and the families that do survive it, they're really strong. I lost my father before I got the the sentence. My father, he, he dies knowing that I'm a murderer. 
and he didn't expect such things from me. We receive many letters every week from inmates, from their families, from their friends, um, complaining and asking for help about conditions behind bars. Um, and I met Tembekile and I agreed to help him, not because he claimed to be innocent, but because he couldn't obtain his trial transcripts, which are essential to um, appeal your case. And he'd been trying at that stage for eight years. I have exhausted all avenues. And then my other two co-accused also went to the Constitutional Court and then their matter was here, and then the person who was representing the state told the presiding officer in the Constitutional Court that when they give my co-accused freedom, accused number five, by that time the prosecutor did not know it was me, must also get freedom because of he was convicted wrongly. So the Constitutional Court re-invited me again so that my matter can be reheared and then I was released on June, June 2015. That's when I get my freedom. I was in prison for 11 years. As they say, forgive and forget. I forgive everybody for whatever she or he has done for me, but I can't forget what had happened to me this, it's, a, it's something I will die with it for the rest of my life. But they've done whatever they've done. Then at the end of the day, I've come back. I've told myself that no, this is time to rebuild my life, to start afresh, forget about everything that has happened in the past, focus in life, do the right things, just say thanks. I've been given the second chance for life. I cannot hold grudge with the people that has wronged me because of uh, uh, thinking of things that have uh, happened in my life. It's going just to cause bitterness. So I have forgive them before they can apologize. So well now I have opened new pages. I have focused on the future and then Though they have not apologized me, I'm just moving on with my life. I don't want to look what have happened behind me. So the Vest Justice Project and the Vets and the, uh, the Invest, Invest Tech Bank, they've been helpful, helpful with me. I've been going through the counseling. Even now I'm still getting counsel. So, you know, this, this, this thing that happened on my life is not something that cause pain on my flesh. It's something that has, uh, uh, has, uh, it has pained me on my, on my brain. So everything, the trauma is tattooed on my brain and then it cannot be erased and then it cannot be deleted. If a criminal justice system works in such an old, old machine that it serves everybody, it will reduce crime, you know. Um, Rehabilitation will, will happen the way that rehabilitation is supposed to happen. Uh, my children will be safer in the streets uh, because people that deserve to be in jail will be in jail. Uh, and people that are innocent will be out, you know. Uh, and people that can be rehabilitated will be rehabilitated. So the criminal justice system needs to be such a machine that it serves everybody and this is why I'm here. My hopes for the future is to see myself as a <laughs> as a helping hand to help others that are still behind bars for the crime that they did not commit. Because of, it is so painful to be drowning in the sea of prisoners, knowing that you did not commit crime. Only you and God knows that you did not do it. But you are there saving for the sentence that, or the crime that you did not do. For me, I've never experienced anything like the feeling of watching a man who's been wrongfully convicted and experience the ultimate betrayal by the criminal justice system and spent years and years and years behind bars for a crime they've always claimed they didn't commit. To see a person like that 
walk out of prison as a free man who can now hold their head up high and to know that you've assisted them in some small way even to obtain their freedom is an extraordinary feeling and so I think that, that for me Derek Eretz is basically tikkun olam that if you save one person, you save the world. And I guess that's what drives my work. Mosaic was established in 1993 in response to high levels of violence against women, in particular domestic violence. Mosaic empowers women as social auxiliary workers and court support workers in targeted township communities where a lack of resources can affect the ability of many to access healing and training services. 25 years ago, there was no organization working with abused people. People felt stigmatized, they were, they were ashamed to be abused. And also, there were other organizations who charged on a scale. And for me, it was wrong, because I realized these were poor people. They needed to be trained in their language, in venues that were close to them. And so I trained 12 and eventually it was 10 women in the first group. I trained them in my social work skills. The training that um, I received from Urolin was about healing myself first, uh, understanding my roots before understanding other people's issues. And then the training that I got uh, built me up so that I can be able to assist other women. Because although I didn't know that I was a victim of domestic violence, I then even discovered that I am part of people, women that are abused through the training that I undergo. Then I started healing myself through the training and that enabled me to heal the other women outside. While they educated, there were people who wanted counseling so they came to them for counselling and from counselling they went into support groups, we ran training workshops, so we reached the people who we needed to reach. As a progressive Jew, it's very important to do tikkun olam and specifically mosaic is because of the huge amount of violence in this country and the huge amount of gender-based violence and I think uh, I be believing in the equality of women, that women need to stand up for themselves and be empowered to believe in themselves and not be victims and to be able to handle situations that are coming their way. Personally, I didn't think much of you know, what social work. What's that? You, you deal with your problems at home, things like that. And for me, it wasn't really that big a thing until I came to Mosaic. And when there used to be workshops or training, I used to sit in. Uh, I went to a couple of trainings. I did the sexual violence training course. I did the um, gender-based violence course. And that is how I learned. And I, one day in one of the workshops, I turned around and I said, you know, if I had known sooner, this probably would have been my work earlier in life, my, my career. Because you don't realize until you're really in it what is really going out on outside there because there is a big need and the work that women do, it's amazing work. I think it's absolutely important in the communities that they, the people who are getting the services live in because otherwise they don't have a voice and at least now they're able to, through the court workers and for the people that they feel comfortable with to be able to approach them and get the services that they so desperately need. We work in the different centres. Our community workers go out. As Dawn went out this morning to run a workshop, 
and also people ask Mosaic uh, community workers to come and talk about, you know, abuse. Mosaic uh, 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 is also one of our partners. We are hub partners here, so they refer clients to us. When they see that the the person has experienced domestic is experiencing domestic violence, they will refer the person to us. And then, if the person maybe must uh, is willing, if the perpetrator is willing to come for and attend counselling sessions, we don't do we don't provide those counselling sessions. We refer the person the perpetrator to Mosaic together with a partner. We're doing presentations in clinics, communities giving awareness about violence in homes or, or wherever. Now I'm working as a social auxiliary worker, counselling in families, one-on-one, -on -one and in men as well. We don't choose, we don't discriminate, in other words, we help everyone who comes. The victim comes in and then the social worker calls in the family so the families know about it. The families get relief by talking it through, perhaps some kind of mediation with the perpetrator. And so the word spreads that if you want help, you can come to these, this organization to get assistance with these problems that you have. People are faced with court, they want to come to terms with their, the situation with their husband and the court workers assist them in the process which is very confusing to them and assist because magistrates have said to me we can tell we can put an order upon a husband but we know they're going to go back in a month with the same situation so mosaic steps in and counsels the family how to cope with it and counsels the men and giving them some other options about how to cope rather than just with anger and violence. So the courts are some of the situations. Then there's the rape crisis situations, the assistance in, in rape uh, centers in the hospital where victims of rape can get support and guidance and counseling. So these are just one or two of the many things. My wish for Mosaic is that we spread the healing further. I'm going to do a train the trainer course where I'm going to take some of the Mosaic people and train them how to train. Not only training people about abuse, but to train trainers who can train people about abuse and train other trainers. For me, Derek Eriks and, and for Mosaic, it's about writing the injustices that the people of these communities have to deal with on a daily basis. And for the group of people that are privileged to work for Mosaic, and many of them themselves having been abused and have been, have been assisted in the past, they are now going into their communities and assisting the people there. Historical writer Leon Uris said, the only thing that is going to save mankind is if enough people live their lives for something or someone other than themselves. We would love you to be part of the conversation, so share your views and stories on our Facebook page at Derek Eretz Connect. From me, Romy Stach and the Derek Eretz team, remember that we can all embrace a sense of responsibility for each other's welfare.